Why News with William Theo, Angelo Castro III, and Darlene Basingan. Good evening. Evacuation continues in villages near Mount Mayon as it shows signs of rising magma that could lead to hazardous eruptions. Here's why from Ray Pelayo. So one of those information na kasama do sa basis why Tibo raised the alert. So uh, hindi lang paint na yun ano, hindi uh, brighter compared to the previous night. Fivox raised the alert to level 3 at Mayon Volcano and residents with 6-kilometer permanent danger zone from the radius of the volcano have started to evacuate. As of this afternoon, the abnormal activities of the volcano have affected around 2,785 families or 10,966 individuals from 16 villages in the four municipalities of Alba. Local authorities expect the number of affected to further rise as the evacuation of residents in towns around the 6-kilometer permanent danger zone and 7-kilometer extended danger zone remains ongoing. The Provincial Social Welfare and Development Office or PSWD begins repacking of relief goods that will be distributed to affected families. Mayon's most destructive eruption was in February 1841 when lava flows buried a town and killed 1,200 people. It last erupted in 2014, spewing lava and forcing thousands of people to evacuate. Alvay Governor Al Francis Bichara also notes they are waiting for the approval of the national government before placing the entire province under a state of calamity. We will identify what are those available logistics that we have so that deducting all available logistics from us, tapos makita natin yung need, but available po yun at hindi pa available sa national government, Ray Pilayo, UNTV, News and Rescue, Philippines. Meanwhile, the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council is now on blue alert status to monitor the activities of Mayon Volcano in Albay. The agency also extends the coverage of the danger zone to 8-kilometer radius from Mayon. Leia Ilagad will tell us why. NDRRMC evacuated 3,061 families or 12,044 individuals affected by recent activities of Mayon Volcano. Most of the evacuees are from the town of Kamalig, Ginubatan, and Maliliput. Meron din po tayong 10 evacuation centers sa naturang lugar na kaya dahil dito sa uh, lava flow at yung pag, uh, ano na mga ash fall dahil dito sa pagtutok ng vulkan ngayon. NDRRMC spokesperson Romina Marasigan says they are now in blue alert status for more speedy coordination. Marasigan adds that they have also implemented force evacuation in Daraga and Legaspi City because of the lava flow. And in enforce din natin yung hindi na sila babalik pa no, doon sa mga lugar na yan. Baka kasi yung iba tinitignan yung kanilang panadim. Iniiwas na po natin na bumalik ang ating mga kababayan para ma makaiwas tayo sa tiyak na peligro. The NDRRMC has also extended the coverage of the danger zone to 8 km radius from Mount Mayon that is now in alert level 3 status. Marasigan said the agency distributed face masks to protect residents from the bad effect of volcanic ash. Leia Ilagan, UNTV, News and Rescue, Com Aguinaldo. In other news, President Rodrigo Duterte signs the executive order on travel ban against government officials and employees. Meanwhile, Presidential Communications Secretary Martin Andanar defends his trips abroad. Rosalie Cos will tell us why. Though Malacanang has yet to issue the official document, President Rodrigo Duterte has announced that he already signed the executive order that will ban the foreign trips of government officials and personnel. Such travel ban, however, will not apply when duly accomplished documents that will justify such trip will be submitted. The order covers those who are under the executive branch down to the local government units. The president made the announcement during the 60th birthday celebration of House Speaker Pantaleon Alvarez last Friday night in Tagum City, Davao del Norte. Here, the president had once again criticized those officials who were extravagant in using government funds in traveling abroad to attend conferences. 
among those who were already dismissed by the president because of alleged junkets are Maritime Industry Authority Administrator Marshall Amaro, who had 18 foreign trips since he assumed office. And former Presidential Commission for the Urban Poor Chairperson Terry Redon, who had allegedly eight foreign trips. Meanwhile, Presidential Communications Secretary Martin Andanar defends himself against those who criticize the 10 overseas trips he has made from 2016 to 2017. The official says four of these trips are sponsored by the host country, while two are shouldered by the Secretary himself. Andanar adds that the President also gave him permission, particularly when he went to America to attend the inauguration of U.S. President Donald Trump. Aside from this, his foreign trips were connected in performing his mandate and he was able to get 70 million pesos worth of donations from China for the PCOO. Among the countries he has gone to are United Kingdom, France, USA, Malaysia, Hong Kong and Australia. Recently, a memorandum from Executive Secretary Salvador Medialdea was issued to enumerate the regulations for members of the cabinet, chiefs of agencies, government-owned and or controlled corporations and government financial institutions. Based on the memorandum, an official or employee can go out of the country if the trip has something to do with the agency's mandate without expensive expenses and the country will benefit from it. Any government official or personnel cannot travel abroad if there is no travel authorization from his agency, no filled out leave form and the operation in his office will be affected. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue, Malacanã. The Philippines and China are set to conduct their second bilateral consul consultative mechanism talks next month. The bilateral talks will center on the territorial dispute on the West Philippine Sea. Here's why from Nel Maribuho. The Department of Foreign Affairs, or DFA, defended itself from allegations that it is not taking steps to stop China's ongoing militarization of the West Philippine Sea. Critics particularly refer to Beijing's construction of military structures in the disputed territory, which they allege the DFA is not addressing. Bakit daw maraming ships, whether Coast Guard or Navy, near Pag-asa? Because the Chinese are just being very sensitive na walang mag-build sa sandbars o kahit anong features kasi may usapan, no building. According to DFA Secretary Alan Peter Cayetano, Philippines and China continue to discuss ways on how to resolve the dispute in a peaceful manner. Manila and Beijing are set to discuss some sensitive information regarding the West Philippine Sea during their second bilateral consultation in February. Lahat ng issue na yan, pati sa fishermen, uh, pati how... Uh, how do we see the long term? Where will we be five years from now, 10 years, 15 years from now? Uh, if other countries are using the word militarization, how do you define militarization? DFA notes the two countries may also discuss the possibility of jointly exploration in the disputed waters. There are samples around the world where there are disputed areas, pero nagkaroon ng agreement na pwede yung both uh, countries because they dealt with sovereignty rights. Sovereignty rights or economic rights. Nel Maribuho, UNTV News and Rescue, Las Piña City. The Philippine Coast Guard is ready to deploy its men once China pushes its exploration in the Philippine rise. Here's why from Ray Pelayo. After one year and three months, Real Admiral Joel Garcia turned over the post as commandant of the Philippine Coast Guard to Real Admiral Elson Hermohino. The new Coast Guard commandant will focus on the agency's modernization program and in securing the coastal waters of the country. Hermohino also expressed his willingness to send Coast Guard personnel to Philippine Rice if he will be ordered to do so amid the possible exploration of China in the area. Kung ang sinabi po ng ating uh, nakakataas ay uh, mag-deploy, eh, tayo po ay mag-deploy. Magdolo Partalis Representative Gary Alejano disclosed that the Department of Foreign Affairs approved a conduct of marine scientific survey by the Oceanology China Academy of Sciences in eastern Mindanao and eastern Luzon, wherein Philippine rice is located. Alejano notes that the survey will run from January 24 to February 25 this year. Alejano questions why the Philippines allowed China while it already experienced and witnessed the latter's reclamation activities in other countries' territories. 
The lawmaker argues that any foreign exploration in the Philippine waters should be accompanied by Filipino scientists and that the Philippines will also be allowed to use any data that will be gathered from the area. Ang ibang bansa ay hindi naman uh, nagkagrab ng ating teritoryo. Hindi hmm. naman uh, nagkaklaim ng ating teritoryo. Except China. So dapat maging maingat tayo dyan. Presidential spokesperson Harry Roque, meanwhile, says the president has the right on who to allow to do such an activity in the area. Because that the president decided so as chief architect of foreign policy. I'm sure, as stated by Secretary Alan Cayetano, other countries, if they wish, may also apply. Have they applied? I do not think so. But for a Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources, Hindi natin pwedeng basta na yung papasukan ng mga ng mga exploration, especially on power and uh, energy, kung makakasira siya sa fish habitat. No? Ray Pilayo, UNTV, Use and Rescue, Manila. President Rodrigo Duterte accepts the resignation of Commission on Higher Education Chairperson Patricia Licuanan. Rosalie Cos will tell us why. Malacanang neither confirm nor deny that it is Chairperson Patricia Licuanan of CHED who President Rodrigo Duterte is referring to as the government official he will dismiss because of corruption. However, Presidential Spokesperson Secretary Harry Roque confirms that the President has already accepted Licuanan's resignation. Roque adds that the Chief Executive has also been made aware of the allegations against the CHED official. I wish to announce that the President has received the resignation of uh, CHED um, Chairperson Patricia Licuanan and that it will be accepted by the President. Roque did not add any other details anymore of other government officials that the president will remove from post. In her resignation statement, Licuanan said she had received a call from Executive Secretary Salvador Medialdea during the weekend and asked her to resign. Although her term will already be ending in July 2018, she says she decided to step down from office ahead of time. She adds that it is obvious that there are people in CHED who wanted her out of the commission and hurled baseless and false accusations, including her travel abroad. Malacanang, on the other hand, chose not to comment on the issue. No information. I, am, I only announced that she resigned. Resignation is always a voluntary act. Meanwhile, the former chair of Senate Education, Arts and Culture Committee, Senator Bam Aquino, felt sorry over Licuanan's resignation. He says Licuanan's dedication has done well to improve the access to quality education. Aquino also calls on Malacanang to appoint an immediate replacement with the same ability as that of the former chief to implement reforms. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue, Malacanang. The Senate is set to prioritize a deliberation on the proposal to amend or revise the Constitution as the session resumes today. Nel Maribohok will tell us why. The Senate resumes its session today and tackled the proposal to amend or revise the Constitution. For Senator Grace Poe, the revision on the 1987 Constitution should not only focus on the political structure but also on the economic makeup of the country. Kung gusto natin na lumago ang ating ekonomiya at dumami ang mamumuhunan sa ating bansa, ang pag-relax uh, -re ng foreign ownership ng mga businesses, yan ay sa economic provisions. The minority group, meanwhile, has expressed its opposition and reported proposal that the federal form of government will be unicameral, which means the abolition of the Senate. Kung maging unicameral, then... Uh... <laughs> Uh, whatever the House of Representatives wants, the House of Representatives gets. On the other hand, Senator Panfilo Lacson today files a resolution calling for the Senate to convene as a constituent assembly wherein amendments or revision of constitution should be approved by three-fourth votes of the Senate. Senator Lacson made the proposal amid questions of how the two chambers of Congress will vote in Econ as. Some senators express support on the said resolution. Uh, it's separate voting, uh, separate session. There is nothing uh, that requires us to physically assemble as one. Dahil ayon sa diwa ng konstitusyon na kung magkokon asma ng anumang uh, lehislatura ay dapat voting separately. 
The Senate Committee on Constitutional Amendments and Revision of Codes will resume its hearing on charter change on Wednesday. Three former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court such as C.J. Renato Puno, Hilario Davide Jr. and Artemio Panganiban were invited to attend the hearing. Nel Maribuho, UNTV News and Rescue, Senate of the Philippines. The Metropolitan Manila Development Authority temporarily blocks the construction of the rail track of the MRT Line 7 along North Avenue in Quezon City. Here's why from Monoxon. The Metropolitan Manila Development Authority or MMDA explains that the MRT 7 Project Traffic Management Task Force gave them a short notice about the construction prompting the agency to postpone it. MD is 100% in support of the government's build, build, build program. No? Kailangan, kailangan natin mga kababayan yan. Ang sa atin lang, inaayos lang natin. The MMDA says it will study first the possible impact on traffic flow of the construction of MRT 7 along North Avenue. The MMDA says North Avenue is far more narrower than Commonwealth Avenue where portions of the MRT Line 7 are being constructed. The construction will occupy one lane along North Avenue, leaving two lanes available for motorists. Para mas mapag-usapan, ano ba talaga yung plano, rerouting schemes, and kung meron silang uh, in additional inputs at meron silang um, enforcement na kailangang uh, gawin, uh, maisagawa nila. Based on the plan of MRT-7, the construction of its first phase will begin in front of the Veterans Memorial Medical Center and on Agham Road. The second phase will begin on a part of Agham Road and Mindanao Avenue, while the third phase will start on EDSA and Mindanao Avenue. Pero sana yung mga private na mga sakyan, saka yung mga truck, kung maaari, wag na muna dumaan dito, humanap sila ng dana para sa kanila, para lumuwag-luwag dito. Okay lang po, wala tayong magagawa ron. The MRT Line 7 is a 22-kilometer rail system that will begin on Edson North Avenue and will end on San Jose del Monte, Bulacan. The government targets to complete its construction in the first quarter of 2020. Mon Hoxon, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. Next on Y News. Forensic experts from the Public Attorney's Office discover severe symptoms in children who died from Dengvaksha. The Department of Foreign Affairs launches mobile passport services across the country. And the price of commercial rice is expected to increase in the coming days. Y News will be right back. Public Attorney's Office Chief Attorney Persida Costa has assured teachers and health workers that they will not be included in the criminal charges which they are preparing. Meanwhile, the PAO forensic expert has discovered severe symptoms among victims of Dengvaksha. Roderick Mendoza will tell us why. The Public Attorney's Office is still drafting the criminal complaint against the persons responsible for the Dengvaksha mess. But even this early, they already cleared the health workers and teachers who helped in the inoculation of over 800,000 pupils. Pau Chief Attorney Persida Acosta says they were just deceived that it is for the good of the children. Hindi po kayo namin ididimanda sapagkat kayo lang ay namisled. Dahil merong ano to eh, parang blessings ng DOH eh, na ginawa noon. But Acosta assures the persons behind the anti-dengue vaccination program will be held accountable. Ah, sa mga kasuhan, ayoko muna mag-announce. Pero alam naman ng taong bayan kung sino ang dapat kasuhan. Dito sa pagkamatay ng mga bata, ano? The PAO chief also encourages health officers to declare the real cause of death 
in the death certificate whenever a child died of severe dengue. The Pau Forensic Laboratory has completed the analysis of seven victims. According to Dr. Erwin Erfe, they found a pattern in the cases of the children from the time they were inoculated with Dengvaxia until they eventually fell sick and died. Within that six-month period after the vaccination, eh, nagkakasakit yung bata at uh, namamatay eventually. Yung from the time ng onset ng symptoms at saka mamatay yung bata, merong 12 hours, may 24 hours, merong 48 hours, napakabilis. He found the case of a 13-year-old from Balanga Bataan the most disturbing as the victim died just 12 hours after showing symptoms of dengue. The victim has severe bleeding in the brain. He is asking experts to study the case and make a treatment protocol. Yun ho yung tinitingnan namin to save the children na maaaring magkasakit pa in the future. Dapat mabilis ang aksyon dito kasi hindi po biro ito nakikita namin kakaiba. Meanwhile, Health Secretary Francisco Duque III encourages the accusers to produce evidence of the so-called mafia operating inside his agency. He says they can file charges if indeed they have evidence to back it up. Nonetheless, Duque will initiate a probe into the contracts of the previous administration. Last Saturday, former DOH consultant Dr. Francis Cruz revealed that health officials allegedly conspired and benefited from the purchase of Dengvaxia. Roderick Mendoza, UNTV News and Rescue, Manila. The Department of Trade and Industry, or DTI, allays the public's fear over the possible impact of the tax reform law on products and services. Monokson will tell us why. In an interview in the program Get It Straight with Daniel Razon, Trade Secretary Ramon Lopez says the country's new taxation system will only have minimal impact on the prices of basic commodities. Lopez explains the government will not impose excise tax on basic commodities. The DTI secretary presented a data showing that a not more than 50 centavo increase in prices of products. Based on DTI's estimates, the tax reform law will cause a 4 centavos increase in the prices of sardines, 3 centavos in prices of powdered milk, 3 centavos in instant noodles, 14 centavos in loaf bread, 6 cents in prices of pandesal, 4 centavos in laundry soaps, and 7 centavos in canned goods. According to Secretary Lopez, although the amount of excise tax on petroleum products will rise, it will not have a huge impact on basic commodities. Petroleum is just 5% of the transport cost of products. The DTI official also notes the government can immediately enforce the train law, although it has no implementing rules and regulations yet. Nandiyan yung batas at madino naman po yung pati mga schedule, yung tax rate at yung implementation. So, sa amin hong pagkaintindi ay, uh, ay uh, pwede na siyang i-implement. The agency also vows to monitor the movement of prices in the market to prevent any collusion between manufacturers and retailers. Those proven to have unfairly increased prices of basic commodities will face charges of profiteering. Violators will face an imprisonment of 5 years up to 15 years and fines of 5,000 pesos to 2 million pesos. Secretary Lopez is confident that only a huge percentage of manufacturers and retailers will take unfair advantage of the possible impact of the train law. May self-correcting mechanism yan. Apo. Pag lahat sila mataas, sigurado, I will bet my salary, mm -mm. one year salary, uh -huh. na may papasok na isa pang competition. Na mas mababa. Na mas mababa. Sasabihin nila, ah, nag-aabuso to. May opportunity sa presyo na to. Mm -mm. May papasok at papasok na negosyante. DTI's website has list of products with suggested retail prices that the public can compare with the products being sold in the market. The agency says it is conducting a nationwide monitor to prevent anyone from abusing the implementation of the train law. The public may report to DTI hotline number 7513330 anyone who will violate the suggested retail price of basic commodities. Mon Hoxon, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. The Department of Foreign Affairs launches its Project Passport on Wheels today. Here's why from Nel Maribo. 
passport printing machines begin to make rounds in various parts of the country. This is through the so-called Passport on Wheels launched today by the Department of Foreign Affairs or DFA. Four vans carrying passport printing machines with DFA personnel on board will process the passports. Earlier today, residents of Las Piñas City were among the first to benefit from the Passport on Wheels. For this Passport on Wheels initiative or scheme, in response to the clamor of many Filipinos for available slots for their passport processing. So if you have a school, na lahat ng teacher, uh, ibang sudyante, ibang kapitbay, gustong kumuha, paparada lang natin, bigyan nyo lang kami ng kwarto, no? Gagawin namin to. Each van can produce up to 500 passports a day. With this, the DFA targets to double the production of passports this year to address the problem on the long appointment waiting time for passport insurance. So from 9,000 a day, we want to be able to process uh, 18,000 a day. Pag, pag nangyari yon, bababa to about one month na lang ang waiting sa appointment. Based on the figures of the DFA, the production of Philippine passport rose to 3.7 million in 2017. The agency says the application for passport increases also by 30% every year. Nel Maribuho, UNTV News and Rescue, Las Piñas. The Securities and Exchange Commission revokes the registration of Rappler News Organization. Here's why from Rosalie Cos. Violation of the provision of the Constitution on the ownership and management of mass media is the reason why the Securities and Exchange Commission revokes the registration of Rappler News Organization. Particularly Article 16, Section 11 of 1987 Philippine Constitution, which states that the ownership and management of mass media is limited to Filipinos. Based on the investigation of SEC, Rappler's funds come from Omidyar Network and the founder of it is the businessman Pierre Omidyar. Rappler criticizes the SEC's decision and said this is first in the history of the Commission and the Philippine media. Based on their statement, they have been transparent in their practices, complied with all the regulations of SEC, and submitted all requirements. Rappler will also pursue all legal processes to contest this decision and will fight for the freedom of the press. The revocation of the registration of Rappler garnered a lot of reactions. So that's worrisome, but uh, let, me, let me read the, uh, the resolution of, uh, of the SEC. Pero dapat, uh... Masiguro natin yan. Dapat uh, uh, ipaliwanag may igi sa tao kung talagang totoo na hindi sila 100%. Na yung pagpapasara sa kanila ay isang napakamasamang hudyat sa lalong pagsakal sa freedom of the press at access ng mga mamamayan sa totoong balita. Meanwhile, NUJP said this decision of SEC is a clear example of many threats of the Duterte administration against media critical of his governance. NUJP also calls on Filipino journalists to unite and resist those who are trying to silence them. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue, Malacanya. Several associate justices of the Supreme Court testified today regarding some allegations against Chief Justice Maria Lourdes Sereno. The SC justices said they are in favor of dissolving a technical working group Sereno created for the purpose of studying the release of benefits to retired justices and judges. Grace Cassin will tell us why. Supreme Court Associate Justices Samuel Martires and Josdado Peralta believe that there is no need for a technical working group or a TWG created by Supreme Court Chief Justice Maria Lourdes Sereno. The group is in charge of assessing the survivorship benefits of retired justice and justices across the country. The two justices argue that the said TWG only caused a two-year delay in the release of benefits to almost 300 beneficiaries. They note if only Sereno did not create a TWG, some retired justices and judge would have not died without receiving their hardly earned benefits. Some of us are interested or are in favor of dissolving this technical working group. Eh. Kawawa po yung mga biuda. Di Two lang years. Eh. Kung nilawakan lang kasi nila ang kanilang pananaw sa batas, binigyan nila ng interpretasyon na pabor doon sa mga claimants. After all, yung pera naman ay babayad sa claimants nito, hindi magagaling sa kanilang mga bulsa. 
According to complainant attorney Larry Gadon, also causing delay in the release of benefits are the people Sereno hired in the TWG. Gadon claims the employees are not qualified, naming clerk of court attorney Jocelyn Fabian, who is one of the head of the said technical working group. Siya ho ay outsider at siya ang kanyang, ang kanyang work experience ay uh, accountant pala siya sa isang department store na uh, nakasama lang niya sa nakasama niya sa religious organization. In the seventh hearing of the impeachment committee, Committee Chairman Reynaldo Umali expressed dismay over Sereno's failure to appear in the hearing. According to Umali, Sereno wasted the opportunity given to her to personally answer the allegations stated in the impeachment complaint. Respondent's refusal to participate in these proceedings would leave our members with no recourse but to vote on the existence of probable cause considering that the charges will remain uncontroverted. The camp of Chief Justice, on the other hand, explained that it was the committee that refuses to hear them out. Since until now, the lawmakers still prohibits her lawyers to represent her in the proceedings. They also doubt the impeachment committee will give them fair treatment, noting that majority of its members are allies of the administration. Ang pagpupunta po ni Chief Justice Sereno po rito ay hindi na po parang uh, hindi productive no, sa mga ganitong situation. Grace Kasin, UNTV News and Rescue, House of Representatives. The new leadership of the Dangerous Drugs Board sets its focus in prioritizing community-based rehabilitation program for surrenderers. My Bermudez will tell us why. One of the primary priorities of the new leadership of the Dangerous Drugs Board is the expansion of community-based rehabilitation program of the government. DDB Chairman Catalino Cui believes that through this, the number of individuals who will use illegal drugs will be reduced since the monitoring will be more intensive as the campaign will start from the barangay level. Uh, bibigyan natin ng importance yung drug clearing. Eh. So we will yun as uh, we will be ano, we will be uh, we will be uh, requiring also yung mga uh, different local executive na bantayan nilang mabuti yung mga barangay. Kasi ito yung andito yung mga ano eh, andito yung mga clients eh ng ano natin, mga grassroots the new DDB chairman also supports DILG Undersecretary Martin Dino's proposal to require each barangay in the Philippines to submit list of drug suspects. And even though some human rights groups are opposed to the idea, Kui assures that the government will conduct a thorough validation to assure the identity of those involved in illegal drugs. Katulad nung araw, remember, nung may masamasin pa, uh, yung uh, ang, ang uh, objective nung uh, program sana na yon is tatlo eh. Yung anti-illegal drug, anti-corruption, anti-criminality, anti-violent extremism. The government will also look into police operational procedures of each law enforcement agency in the country in order to protect human rights of drug suspects. Kui is the 23rd chairman of DDB and replaced Jonicio Santiago following the latter's resignation in November last year. My Bermudez, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. The Bureau of Customs spoils the activity of an alleged syndicate from Pakistan. Raja Ladora will tell us why. The Bureau of Customs formally turns over to the Philippine Drug Enforcement Agency the part drugs they intercepted with a street value of more than 1.2 billion pesos. According to BOC Chief Commissioner Isidro La Peña, the party drugs that were seized last January 4 and 10 were believed to have come from Pakistan. Peddling or uh, specializing on these uh, mga illegal uh, drug, uh, drugs, ito, mga tablets, uh, which can be used uh, for party purposes. BOC personnel detected the 2 million pieces of party drugs which were in tablet form in a shipment at the Philpost office in Naiya. The BOC is now in pursuit of the consignees of the shipment identified as Peter Parcon and Jocelyn Villarino. They did not appear during the, uh, the interception. Actually, it, a, um, uh, it stayed for some time with the, with the post office. But nung walang uh, lumitaw, then we decided to have it uh, uh, confiscated. The BOC will also be in a lookout for the Filipino counterparts of the Pakistan Drug Syndicate. Rajal Adora, UNTV News Rescue, 
Philippines. Meanwhile, the supply of NFA rice in Kamuning market has decreased while the price of commercial rice is expected to increase. Ray Pelayo will tell us why. The supply of NFA rice in Kamuning market has reduced by half. Crescent Cesario, an authorized dealer, says they only receive 50 sacks of NFA rice a week from their latest delivery as compared to the usual 100 sacks. She says more consumers prefer to buy NFA rice because of its stable price of 27 pesos of regular milled and 33 pesos for well milled. The price of commercial rice, however, is expected to increase in the coming days. Crescentia notes that the capital per sack of rice has increased by 30 to 50 pesos and they plan to pass it on to the consumers by a 1 peso increase per kilogram of rice. She adds that the increase is just normal in the first quarter of the year because it's not yet harvest season. Ngayon, pinauubos lang namin yung dati naming stock. Mga one or two weeks, yung aming 40 magiging 41 na. Meanwhile, the National Food Authority confirms that they really reduced the supply in marketplaces because they prioritize to supply calamity heat areas. The National Food Authority is just waiting for the approval of their requests in order to push through with the importation of 250,000 metric tons of rice. NFA adds that based on their inventory on December 31, 2017, the country has a rice reserve that is good for 89 days. Ray Pilayo, UNTV, News and Rescue, Quezon City. Authorities believe the low temperature in Benguet has no impact yet on the crops of farmers in the Said province. Here's why from Rajel Adora. Baguio City continues to experience low temperature. Based on the report of State Weather Bureau Pag-asa, the temperature in the city dropped to 11.4 degrees Celsius yesterday. Pag-asa expects Baguio City's temperature to further drop in the coming days. In Atok Sambangan and Bugias, Farmers already see some indication of frostbite in their crops. Because of this, farmers take steps to protect their crops from frostbite. The Benguet Farmers Marketing Cooperative is hoping that the declining temperature will not affect the supply of highland vegetable in the following days. Wala kasi programming na sinusunod yung mga farmers. So parang kung ano yung sa tingin nila, eh, gusto nilang ikamin. According sa experience nila, napagbuti na nila ng ganitong buwan, buwan uh, tataas pag ganitong buwan, parang ganon. Wala lang talagang scientific basis kung ano yung tatanin nila, kaya, kaya ganyan. Meanwhile, the prices of some vegetables like potatoes, cabbage, and peche bagyo have increased. Katawaan kasi ano, konti ang nag-deliver ngayon, Sunday. Eh. Uh, bukas, dadami na naman yan. Kasi uh, pag Saturday, Sunday, especially Sunday, yan yung parang rest day na din ng mga farmers. About 75% of vegetable supply in Metro Manila comes from Benguet. Rajal Adora, UNTV Rescue, Philippines. Coming up on Y News. Dairy Group Lactalis to further widen its product recall of salmonella contaminated baby food as distribution affects 83 countries. The Peruvian government continues damage assessment after a magnitude 7.1 earthquake rocks the country. And a reunion of OPM artists is happening tonight at the Smart Araneta Coliseum in the Third Wish Music Awards. More from Y News after this break. The AFP Cavaliers eases into the semifinal round as it tops the overall team standings at the at the UNTV Cup season six. Meanwhile, the GSIS Furies finds itself at a must-win situation in its next game to enter the quarterfinal round. Bernard Dadis will tell us why. In the first game, Malacanang PSC Kamao beat the GSIS Furies 76-72 on Sunday at the Pasig City Sports Center. With this victory, the Palace Hoopsters now holds a 6-2 win-loss standing alongside the Senate Defenders and the Judiciary Magis. Kailangan namin manalo kasi ito yung magdedetermine sa amin kung, baka, kung umang pangihilang pa kami. 
Mga mamaya kung natalo kami, eh malaglag kami na malaglag. So talagang pinilit namin na manalo ngayon. Meanwhile, with the loss, the Furies now at 5-4 win-loss standing enters a must-win situation against the NJ Builders in their next match in order to advance to the quarter-final round. Nung first up namin, we're producing a lot of unwanted offense. Kaya yung offense nila ang dali, mabilis sila makatransition. Nung third and fourth quarter, nakapick up ng konti pero hindi pa rin consistent. In the second game, the Senate defenders defeated the Pedea Drug Busters 96-73. Senator Joel Villanueva, who led the defenders, was hailed as best player of the game with 22 points, 1 assist and 2 steals. It's a lot because it's very disappointing, heartbreaking. Everything you can say is our NHA players. So, he said to Senator Sani and Senator Joel, how we bounce back coming off that loss. So, ito, pinakita naman. Now, forced yun. Excitement yun. Ito, walang hesitation. And in the main game, two-time champion AFP Cavaliers eases to the semifinals with a twice-to-beat advantage after demolishing the LJ Builders in yesterday's neck-and-neck -neck main game, 96-89. Sabi ko nga sana, importante yung game. Sabi ko, uh, we just have to continue what we're doing for the past games. Meanwhile, Builders coach Bennett Palad admits encountering problems in yesterday's team performance. I'm trying to solve yung individual skill nila para maging team effort. Medyo nagkakanya-kanya na naman eh. With the win, the AFB is now on top of the team standings with 8 games won and 1 game lost. Bernard Dottie's UNTV News and Rescue, Philippines. Wish Covery's Wishful 4 is now complete. Meanwhile, eliminated Wishful still have the chance to enter the grand finals. Leslie Longboen tells us why. Tubi Colanas showcased their vocal prowess last week for the last slot of Wishcovery's Wishful Four. Early favorite from Naga City, Laika Bonyol, breathed new life to Gary Valenciano hit, Paano. Refreshing, Iba. I think it's... At this point in the competition, tama yung approach ng mm -hmm. Yeah. Reactors were wowed by the performance of Teen Wishful from Camarines Norte, Kimberly Baluzo, who showcased her versatility in singing Sino Ang Baliyo. She brought out how many characters in that one piece? 45. Mga mga. Parang ano, para sang baliw talaga na. Kimberly, who got an almost perfect score, enters the grand finals. Kimberly joins Hazel Bartolome, Carmela Ariola, and Louie Ann Kulala in Wishful 4. Meanwhile, eliminated Wishfuls will also be given a chance to be part of the grand finals through the wild card edition. The 16 eliminated Wishfuls will be grouped into four. One set will battle every week. There will be no power viewing for this round and scores will come solely from reactors. The winners from the four sets will battle for the one remaining spot in the grand finals. Leslie Longboen, UNTV News and Rescue, Philippines. OPM fans are now gathered and enjoying their night at the Big Dome. Leslie Longbowen is in Smart Araneta Coliseum to tell us why live. Yes, Leslie, good evening. Yes, William, Araneta Coliseum is now packed with music lovers to join the third Wish Music Awards. Supporters of artists of the nominees are present here to cheer their favorites. OPM heavyweights are also to perform tonight, including Nina, Morissette, Jet Pangat, JR, Chris Lawrence, among others. The program started with a lively number from Wishcovery's Wishful 20. There are 18 categories for this year, and the Wish Music Awards will give a total of 2.25 million pesos for the winning artists and their chosen beneficiaries. 
Amelia Burley, our winners of the exclusive performance of the year awards have been announced. Among those named are performances of Moira De La Torre, Four of Spades, Milo Pangilinan, Tom Story, Fifth Gen, Morissette, among others. 25,000 pesos goes to the winning artist, while 100,000 pesos goes to the charity of their choice. That's our latest update here at the Spartan Neta Coliseum, William. Yes, thank you very much, Leslie Longboen, live at the Araneta Coliseum. And those are the reasons behind the news. January 15, 2018, I am William Theo. Reasons we delivered to you as they unfold, I am Angelo Castro III. I'm Darlene Basingan because we need to know. We will always ask why. Thank you for watching. Why, why news? news?